It's time to dig into my archive of computer stuff once again. And all of you know, if you've watched my videos before, all of you know that I'm into antique computers of all shapes and sizes, and even some computers that aren't antiques. This one's probably walking the line a little bit with a delivery date in the middle of 2000, specifically this machine was ordered around June of 2000 from Dell, it's not really what most people would consider an antique just yet. But by the standards of uh, computer technology and how fast it moves, this thing might just qualify. But this is also a pretty cool machine because it contains an earlier revision of technology that practically everybody is using in their computer today. Something that used to be reserved for pretty much the technically elite and the very well funded back in the day. Let's go way back in time to talk about this machine and then I'll take you back to the present. I'm going back to the era of the Intel 386 processor, specifically the 386DX, because the 386SX was a cut-down version that might as well not have even applied for something like this. Back around the time that the Intel 386 processor came out, people started to turn their attention to ways of making their computer faster in light of the fact that they couldn't get any faster of a processor than what was already available. They would need to do some complex tasks like scientific research or server usage, uh, heavy database processing, which again kind of slots into the server category. But these kind of things oftentimes found themselves running on a multiprocessor machine. And that is what this machine right here is. This is a Dell Precision 220 workstation. Now, Dell's Precision line is pretty much the top of the line stuff, and they still sell it today. Its only equals would be something from, say, the XPS line, or even the Alienware division of the Dell Computer Company. So where does this fit into your computing today? Well, chances are, even if you have a fairly inexpensive, budget-oriented computer, it probably has a multi-core processor in it. Now, a multi-core processor is actually several processor cores on one physical chip. This machine differs from that because this is a true multi-processing setup with two separate processors. In this case, this thing has two 1 GHz Intel Coppermine Pentium 3 processors in it and it contains suitable logic on the motherboard to handle driving them both. Now Intel generally didn't care too much if their processors were used in multi-processing arrangements unless of course they were budget processors like say the Celeron chip would have been. But even then motherboard manufacturers usually figured it out. Today your computer contains a modern variant of this technology. Instead of multiple physical CPUs you have multiple CPU cores on one chip. Unless, of course, you have a pretty cheap and nasty or, of course, older computer system. Now, if you have an older computer system, you might have a Pentium 4 processor in it. And the Pentium 4 processor, some later revisions from the Northwood and Prescott families, actually featured a technology known as hyper-threading. And while hyper-threading makes the processor appear to have two separate cores, hyper-threading is actually not a technology that delivers a second processor core for your use. Hyperthreading is merely a technology that tries to take advantage of the Pentium 4 processor's out of order execution technology to keep idle and unused execution units busy with work, thus helping to boost their speed. But Intel's primary strategy with the Pentium 4 processor was to basically keep cranking up the clock speed in the hopes that this would make the computer appreciably faster. But eventually things started to plateau and the thermal situation of the Pentium 4 eventually got to be completely out of control so Intel threw the whole thing out and actually went back to their Intel mobile processors which were themselves based on the Pentium 3 to devise the core Core 2, Core i3, i5, and i7 processors that we have today. So those processors actually skip a generation of technology and have, in a way, more in common with the previous generation Pentium 3 than they do the Pentium 4, although they would have inherited some instruction sets and things like that. Let's go ahead and pop the cover on this machine and have a look at it because there is nothing there is nothing that does this thing justice other than to look at its internals which are suitably impressive. This is a machine that appears to have been actually designed if not assembled in part by Dell. Now these days Dell turns everything over to contract manufacturers and they're really not that much different from any other major PC manufacturer if you buy something like an Inspiron or Studio desktop. The designs have basically become more genericized over time. 
you know, going from this extreme, which was largely, which appears to have largely been a Dell design that was assembled by a company known as Trend Technologies at Round Rock, Texas, who for all I know could have been a division of Dell at one point in time, to machines that were assembled by Foxconn and then final assembly to build to order was done at Dell, and these days it seems that all the assembly is pretty much being done outside of Dell by contract assemblers, even the final phases of building the machine. But this machine is definitely fairly unique. It starts out with a toolless case. You can actually pop the cover by just pressing this button on the front, which has a picture of a computer tower and a check mark on it. And when you've done that, the case simply lifts off to reveal the magic within. And boy, do we have magic within here. You can see this uh, green baffle here. This actually is the air guide that covers the two Pentium 3 1 gigahertz copper mine processors that this thing is equipped with. They are slotted processors. I don't know if this thing would support later processors using a slot kit or slocket adapter. I don't intend to try because I'm not at all unhappy with this thing's performance. There's a world of PCI expansion slots available in here as well as one AGP graphics slot which is populated. Dell thought about putting some kind of a large chip on the motherboard there but they never did it. And then down at the bottom you can see the 16-bit end of an ISA slot that never made it to production. Now this board is unlike anything that Dell used in any more modern system. It looks to me like it really was a Dell design. Again, I don't have much proof of that, but there are some things done on this board that are fairly unique and it does bear a Dell copyright. And the MAC address of the built-in Ethernet adapter also points to an entity known as WWPCBA Test which gives a Round Rock, Texas address, which I suppose was a cover name for Dell's motherboard design operations. The onboard Ethernet hardware is not what you would expect it to be. It's not an Intel Ethernet adapter. It's actually a 3Com fast Etherlink adapter that is built directly onto the board. Now this came fairly late in 3Com's life. 3Com was once a huge, high-quality provider of networking hardware, but the proliferation of integrated networking hardware on motherboards pretty much drove them out of the business, and while they managed to stay afloat by producing business class gateways and routers and things, that's a market that was pretty much dominated by Cisco systems, and in 2010 the party finally came to an end when Hewlett Packard Corporation bought up whatever was left of 3Com. 3Com didn't actually fail per se, but they found the going extremely difficult. And there are actually two different mounting points for the 3Com networking chip on here. There's this ball grid array, and there's this uh, pin pack up here, which is not really the correct name for that package, but it's not coming to mind, so I can't do any better than that. The, uh, I have a Dimension 8100 and the Optiplex uh, GX400 that also use integrated uh, 3Com networking. This board has integrated audio and an amplifier that leads to a speaker in the front panel. There's a chassis intrusion switch over here which is a feature you'll find on nearly any business grade machine. There's a brace here with a kind of uh, press button that allows you to release it after you've unscrewed it from around the AGP slot here. And of course there you can see the PCI slots. Now a high performance machine like this back in the day would have used Intel's favorite technology of the week, Rambus RDRAM. This thing uses Rambus PC600 memory. It has um, 768 megabytes of memory installed. The heat sinks on Rambus memory are actually quite functional. They are needed because that memory gets very hot in operation, whereas the heat sinks that you find on uh, modern DDR2, DDR3, and what have you memory are largely decorative, unless of course you're really pushing the memory hard and overclocking. Now Rambus technology, although it was fast, it never really took off in the face of cheaper SD RAM and other technologies, and Intel insisted on using Rambus for the longest time and then finally relented. The first product they produced after the Intel 440 chipset was the Intel 815 that took uh, SD RAM memory and it was kind of a tacit admission that you know they were tired of the Taiwanese chipset makers like VIA and SIS eating their lunch and they had to answer the demands of the market whether they felt the product was technically superior or not. 
and eventually Intel stopped using RAM bus technology entirely. They were basically the only company that ever backed it. And today RAM bus is still very much in business, but they're in business mainly as a patent troll. They go after companies that produce computer memory technologies with patents they feel are relevant and they sue them. Of course, you have the typical Dell power supply up here. This is an older Dell power supply, and so it has the proprietary, not quite ATX, plus one oddball connector, which you can kind of see back there scheme. Fortunately, these power supplies appear to be very well made. I've certainly never had problems with them. There is the conventional Dell fan back here that pulls air over the processors. Here on the motherboard, you can see the integrated Ethernet, two USB ports, the sound hardware, a collection of legacy ports, and right there are the PS2 ports. And as you can see, this machine predates, or at least did not follow, the uh, PC what, what have you, PC 98, 99, whatever they were, color coding for the ports. This thing does not have any color coding on the ports other than what Dell printed on the case after the fact. And then up here are the three little Dell diagnostic LEDs, which shine various colors and should all eventually turn green at the successful completion of a power on self-test. I have installed a couple of option cards in this system. One of them is a USB 2.0 card and the other one is a FireWire adapter, just because I had them laying around. Now this thing does have a feature that makes it very unique in the world of Pentium 3 machines. The Dell system BIOS for this machine in its latest revisions has full support for 48-bit LBA. That is to say that it has no problem accessing disks and displaying and reporting their capacity correctly that are larger than 137 gigabytes in size. Likewise, any software that's dependent on the Interrupt 13 routines to do disk access, like say DOS, can happily access these big drives as well without any assistive software. And that is definitely a fairly unique procedure. Not everything supports that. Let's go ahead and throw this thing on a scale. There's a lot of steel in this case, and this machine is very impressively heavy. Now, usually I have just enough interesting video material with all my collections of stuff and the interesting happenings between my brothers and I to keep everyone that watches this channel entertained. But every now and again, I go all out for you, ladies and gentlemen. And tonight I really did because I bought a brand new battery for my digital scale, which is Harbor Freight's finest scale, so you probably can't expect too much even with a new battery in it anyway. But it should be somewhere within the realm of acceptable results. So let's put this battery in and see if this thing actually still works. Well, it had me go in there for just a minute because it was displaying only cryptic garbage instead of the stuff it was supposed to display. But it seems to have come to life at long last now. So let's throw this computer on here and see how much this bad boy weighs. All right, I would call that suitably impressive. 41 pounds and five and change ounces. This is the kind of computer that if you dropped it on a new modern day Dell Studio or Inspiron machine, you would probably break it to bits, which just shows you how far the mighty have fallen. Let's get another machine and do a little cross comparison as far as weight goes here. Here's an IBM PS2 Model 85 with some special optional equipment installed. You, can, you may be able to figure out what by looking at that cable that's sticking out of its rump. But in the meantime, what really matters for the sake of our demonstration, obviously the Dell machine compares extremely favorably, despite having an outer shell of plastic, to the IBM PS2, which is one of the better known heavyweight computers of times past. Now for those of you whose center of expertise is not in computing and information technology stuff, you might be asking a very valid question. Does having a multiprocessor machine automatic, automatically make everything twice as fast? Well, no it doesn't, and there are a couple reasons for this. First of all, not every process or program that you can run on a computer can be sped up by running it across multiple processors. Now you might be able to run multiple instances of the program and assign one to each processor, but your operating system has to be aware of the multiprocessing capability of your computer. And operating systems like Windows 95 and 98 are not at all aware of multiprocessing technology. Whereas operating systems like Linux, BSD, Windows NT, 2000, XP, Vista, and 7 are. Now, even then, there are some things that just can't be sped up any more than they are. 
because some computer operations depend on the results of others before they can be processed, i.e. no out-of-order execution is possible because the, the, the next step depends on the previously calculated result in order to be processed. A good explanation that I once picked up, and I don't remember where it's from, otherwise I'd give credit, that was, that to, was to me a great explanation of the limitations of multiprocessing technology is to use an analogy with people. It is to say that nine women can't make a baby in one month. It can't be sped up any more than it already is. But nine women can, at least in theory, make nine babies in nine months. So that's a good way to look at multiprocessing technology in layman's terms, and hopefully it helps you understand it if you're having trouble with some of the concepts. But suffice it to say that with today's focus not so much on making processors faster, but making them more efficient, in a roundabout way these older machines might benefit because they too have multiple processors and a lot of modern software is being written for multi-core processors which is an advantage that can in some cases be backported, albeit unintentionally, to these older machines. Well that's pretty much everything I can think to say about this thing hardware wise. Why don't we go ahead and power it up. I've got a flat panel monitor over there just got to find some power cords, a mouse, and a keyboard, and I'll be right back, and we can take a look at this thing. I'm actually running Windows XP Professional on this, which supports a total of, I believe, just two physical microprocessors, which is, which is an advantage that you multiple core processors have over people who are using actual physical processors. Although Windows XP and certain other consumer versions of Windows are limited as to what they can use processor-wise, they're not limited as to how many cores they can run on as long as all those cores are in one physical processor socket. So that's the limitation, that's how to work around it. Of course if you're lucky enough that you can use something like Linux or BSD or other free operating system software, this limitation doesn't apply to you. And before I go ahead to actually start this thing up, some of you are probably asking what this machine cost when it was new. Well, initially, I would have had to offer just a blind guess, but as it happens, back when I picked this thing up from an auction, I gave $30 for it, which I did not feel was an unreasonable sum of money. I found a copy of Computer Shopper in my closet from the year 2000, and this machine was mentioned in a Dell advertisement on the back, with an 800 megahertz or so single processor configuration that retailed for $1,399. Given that this machine is packing two 1 gigahertz processors, 768 megabytes of factory installed PC 600 RD RAM, which would have been quite a lot back in those days, and the fact that it has a CD burner, two 40 gigabyte parallel ATA hard drives, and it had a CD-ROM drive in it until I replaced it with a Hitachi DVD-ROM drive, I would not be surprised if the base cost for this machine as configured was probably right around the high 2000s, low 3s, somewhere in there. I don't know if it was purchased with a monitor originally or not. The service tag would tell me, but it's been so long since I looked it up that I really can't remember anymore. I think that Dell would have provided a flat panel display for this thing back in the day, but it seems to me that the preferred configuration was a 19-inch Trinitron display at the, at the time. Excuse me, or at least that's what they advertised the machine with. Now, at some point along the way, one of the 40 gigabyte hard drives in this machine either failed or was replaced with a Western Digital 200 gigabyte drive, which was a nice little bonus because it's set up as an additional storage drive. It's still booting from the original factory installed 40 gigabyte Mac Store drive. But let's go ahead and power this thing up. While I do, You'll notice it's pretty quiet, reasonably well behaved. I'll talk a little bit about warranties. Whoever owned this machine was using it as some kind of a server back in the day. And they had a warranty on this thing that probably drove the price up to a ridiculous amount. Probably gave Dell a license to print money, if anything. Because if this machine broke down, according to its service tag, the warranty stipulated that someone would come on site within four hours of the breakdown to fix this machine. And of course I'm running Windows XP Professional on it, which is the, uh, it has that on it as a certificate of authenticity. Now if the ship date is correct, Windows XP wouldn't have been available then, so I don't know if someone was playing funny games with the side panel or what, but has a Windows XP COA, so that's what I'm running on it. 
running Windows XP Professional Service Pack 2, 32-bit of course. And here's the desktop. You can see it's pretty early in the morning. I tend to be quite a night owl. I tend to do my uh, coming up with terrible ideas the best. I do the best job of that late at night and early in the morning, even though I have to work tomorrow, which means I'm probably, probably going to have my wagon dragon for sure. I'll go ahead and let this thing boot up. You can see it's working on it there. It's definitely thinking about it. It could probably benefit greatly from a faster hard drive if I felt the need to install one, but so far I'm not inclined to fix what isn't broken. And of course you can see the floppy drive, the 40 gigabyte boot drive, which hasn't got a whole heck of a lot on it. And you can also see Maybe I never formatted the second drive in this thing. Come to think of it, I don't think I ever did. I don't think I've ever used the 200 gigabyte drive that's in this thing, which is kind of crazy. Now, as you can see, it boots up and runs just like a regular single processor or even modern multi-core processor computer would. This thing does not give anything away until you venture into the Windows Task Manager. And when you venture into the Windows Task Manager and you head over to the Performance tab, you'll see that there are two separated graphs here, one for each physical processor in the machine. Likewise, there is another special facet of the task manager that only appears on multiprocessor or multi-core machines. I'll show that to you in just a minute. The only other place that this machine tips its hand is over in the device manager. There you can see the two installed hard drives, and I went and I checked in the computer management disk utility and I found that I have not indeed ever formatted the second hard drive. I guess I just didn't have anything in mind for it at the time. But down here under processors, you can see that there are two listed. Intel, registered trademark, Pentium, registered trademark, three processor. So this is a dual processor machine, as already mentioned. We go on to the web here. I went ahead and snaked an Ethernet cable across the back room down here in the basement computer lab in a dangerous fashion that should keep uh, know-nothings out of here. And just to give you an idea of this thing's relative performance, we'll just go to the best channel on YouTube. You know, I read that on the internet, so you know it's true. And I swear I'm never going to get enough mileage out of that joke. <laughs> And here it is, the Key Keepers channel, and right up there you can see YouTube's best channel. You can ignore that winking smiley. You can also see I am a huge, huge FlashBlock fan, because I want to play YouTube videos and other Flash widgets on my terms, not some other web designer's terms, because it's my computer, darn it. <laughs> now, like many other business-grade machines, this thing does have a built-in audio speaker in the front panel, as well as an audio amplifier on the motherboard. Of course, you could hook up your own speakers on the back if you were so inclined, but for the most part, there's no need to do that in a business environment. Let's go ahead and see just what the key keeper's been up to. Hopefully, I can use this against him later. I'll go ahead and let that video buffer for a bit. You can see my dad on the tractor back there. We'll go ahead and start this up just so you can see it. Sunday afternoon out at the farm, and he's got to set his truck on his tractor to be prevented. Anyway, I figured I'd do this video for HBC Guy 93. Don't hold me to that, I may not have his name right. He wanted me to do a video of mowing with my simplicity. Now this thing would probably also do a little bit better in the video department, although it's doing quite an acceptable job. I don't think that it is probably up to playing YouTube HD content, just because the uh, Flash Player framework is, uh, you know, not, not exactly optimized for older hardware. I don't know if the HTML5 and uh, WebM video setup would do any better than Flash Player would. I tend to think that it might. But there's, there's just a look at uh, the performance in a web browser. We could go to some other page on the web. You know, Yahoo is a popular place to go. And really, you're waiting more on my internet connection than you are anything else, because I've only got about a 3 megabit connection on a real good day. But there, as you can see, is the Yahoo homepage. 
All right, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about the second processor. Oh, I've got a shortcut on the desktop for this. I don't have to do it the hard way. I participate in distributed net on a lot of my computers, cracking uh, RC5 72-bit encryption and also calculating optimal GLUM rulers on some machines, which is a mathematical concept that you can read more about since I'm not much good at explaining things mathematical or even really understanding a lot of them. Reading and writing I'm pretty good with, arithmetic not so much. Let's go ahead and start this up and I will show you a unique behavior here that surfaces in the Windows Task Manager when you have multiple processors or multiple cores in your computer. Alright, so the distributed net, distributed.net client is up and running in the background and as you can see it is a multiprocessor aware application and it can actually make useful application of multiprocessing or multi-core technology because it's presently holding both of the processors at 100% utilization. Now this doesn't cause a problem with using the computer because all in the world that distributed.net is doing is it's stealing cycles that would otherwise go completely idle, that the processor would spend in its idle loop. Now, you might also notice that this thing is slowly working on kicking up its cooling fan because doing something like this where the processor is normally idle causes a lot more heat generation and so this thing is going to kick up its fans in response to that. But if I go over here to the process tab and I locate the distributed.net process which is running right there and I right click on it there is another option that does not show up on single processor systems and that is called set affinity and what the affinity setting allows you to do and you can see that I have only two physical processors to work with here but the affinity setting controls which processors a given program will be allowed to execute on. So if you want to shovel a program that's doing a lot of busy work off to a second processor and keep the main system processor available for yourself, you can do this in any multiprocessing aware operating system, be it a flavor of Windows NT, Linux, uh, BSD, even OS2 is multiprocessor aware. And I'm sure there are other operating systems out there as well. But when I choose this option, I'm going to go ahead and tell the computer that distributed.net is only allowed to run on CPU 0. And when I do, and I go back over to the performance tab, you'll notice that CPU 0 keeps up at full utilization. You'll also notice that the utilization meter over here is an average and is now sitting at 50%. And over here on CPU 1, it's now completely idle because I have told it that the um, that the process is not allowed to execute on the second processor. And of course this has also had an effect in distributed nets overall core throughput or key cracking rate. It was up around four million keys and change per second. Now it's only doing about two and a half million per second, which is really kind of mind-boggling when you think about it. I don't know for sure if it's uh, possible to starve a process out of running on any processors if you uncheck them both. Uh, you probably could, but it would be a pretty stupid thing to do. So I'll go in here again and I'll change it to where it can only run on processor 1. Go ahead and hit OK. And then as you can see, the picture reverses itself here. Processor 1 is again fully busy, where processor 0 is once again in the idle loop and not doing anything. Well, that's about everything I can think of to say about this system. Hopefully you've enjoyed this little demonstration. I know it's gone on for nearly a half an hour now, and I need to wrap it up, which I will do because I'm sure that I have already asked too much of uh, normally very patient people, and I hope I haven't bored you absolutely to death. But my apologies if I have. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Let's go ahead and close this thing down. It's 12.35 in the morning. Let's call it a night. But there you have it, a very neat multiprocessor Pentium 3 computer. The only multiprocessor computer that I have ever owned, excluding systems that have multiple processor cores on one physical die. So thank you for watching, and if you have a comment below, feel free to leave it for me. And Random Razor, I have a feeling you're going to come along and tell me that you're going to have some popcorn and pizza. Well, I hope you'll share with me if I'm ever in your neck of the woods. Have a great evening, or whatever time of day it is where you're watching this.